to you from the Forge of Freedom studio in the heart of America, a podcast dedicated to preserving freedom and inspiring personal success. Freedom is born and lives through you, the individual, and it dies in the shadows of tyranny, motivating our listeners to become well-rounded, freedom-minded people with the body of an athlete, the mind of a stoic, and the spirit of a warrior. The Tree of Liberty lives on through you, the Forge of Freedom. And now here's your host, Alex Uli. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Forge of Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and this is episode 28 of the Forge of Freedom. Today, I have my father, Mike Uli, back in the studio for Monday Gun Day to provide you with a brief update about the ATF final rule regarding pistol stabilizing braces and to address a question that that we hear from time to time. Can you use force to defend pets? Uh, Mike, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Alex, for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so just briefly, there have been some updates since last week when we talked about the ATF final rule on uh, pistol stabilizing braces. Uh, there have been a few cases circulating around uh, various federal district and circuit courts. One that we've been keeping an eye on is the Mock v. Garland case uh, out of Texas and now uh, being appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And there was a, a little bit of an update in that case. Mike, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and we're talking about down in the Fifth Circuit, which covers uh, that that federal uh, court of appeals covers Texas, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi, I believe. But anyway, there's a, a amongst many, there's a case pending down there, primarily driven by the Firearms Policy Coalition, and I think Maxim Defense. But there was an injunction last week issued in that case. Uh, the Firearms Policy Coalition asked some, for some clarification with respect to who the injunction applied to. And by injunction, I mean it essentially suspends the application of the final rule uh, that the um, ATF passed and that we've talked about on previous episodes. So you'll have to go back and look at those episodes because this is not a brace um, uh, episode. But anyway, there was some clarification that came out of the Fifth Circuit. And amongst other things, the order indicates, at least we think, or actually the uh, Firearms Pol Policy Coalition believes that the injunction against the ATF pistol brace rule now covers all F uh, FPC members, all Firearms Policy Coalition members. And even after that clarification was issued, there was at least some a small uh, question about whether the injunction would be uh, stayed with respect to members of FPC who became members after, for instance, the commencement of the litigation or after the rule was took effect or after this order. So there's some ambiguity there, but I think the only thing I'll say about that is the order's available for you. I think Alex actually has it up in front of us here. But um, And I'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, he'll link to it. But I think the bottom line is, keep in mind, the Farms Policy Coalition thinks that this injunction uh, against the AT or the pistol brace applies to all FPC members, regardless of when they became a member, as long as they're a current member. Yeah, and Mike, you alluded to the fact that we've covered the final rule on at least two prior episodes uh, over the last two weeks on Monday, Gun Day episodes. So if people are more and interested in more detail about the final rule, uh, definitely check out those episodes. But this injunction is not a final ruling on the case, on the merits of the case, right? And we talked about what that means as well, what an injunction means, but it's essentially enjoining or stopping the enforcement of the rule, the final rule that says that you have to register these firearms uh, with uh, equipped with these pistol stabilizing braces, uh, even if they have a, a barrel length of less than 16 inches that would otherwise make them a short barreled rifle. Uh, and, and it's with respect to the plaintiffs in this case, which FPC believes to include all Firearms Policy Coalition members. Is that essentially accurate there? Yeah, I think so. And like you said, we don't want to, we don't want to make this a pistol brace episode, but uh, it's good news. It's not uh, this case is not over. Uh, the Fifth Circuit's going to fast track this appeal, but it's certainly good news that they've issued uh, an injunction in this case. Meaning, and basically, in my mind, it's the the writings on the wall with respect to what's going to happen with regard to this pistol brace, at least in the Fifth Circuit. Yeah, and the the 
the merits panel, the panel of judges that will be deciding this case in the Fifth Circuit uh, in the uh, order clarifying the injunction say that they're going, they're set to hear oral argument on the merits of the case June 29th. So just a little more than a month away, or actually a month away by the time this episode is released. So um, it's good news. I think that the, the writing is on the wall, so to speak, in that regard, at least hopefully, and I uh, hope we get some good news. The Second Amendment Foundation also, I'll just mention briefly, had a case pending in one of the district courts in Texas and received an injunction uh, with respect to the plaintiffs in that case. I'm assuming, but we don't know. I haven't seen any uh, information from the Second Amendment Foundation, but I'm assuming that likewise, it would apply to that injunction would apply to Second Amendment Foundation members like it applies to members of Firearms Policy Coalition here in the mock v. Garland case. Uh, there's also a Gun Owners of America case that's pending uh, in, I believe, also in Texas. And then there's a the Frack v. Garland case in North Dakota that's still out there pending. So there are lots of cases still circulating, challenging this ATF final rule. And I'm hopeful that eventually we'll get a, a great decision on the merits and that this final rule will be uh, struck down eventually. But we still have to wait for that yet, right, Mike? Yeah, there's lots of litigation going out there, but it seems as if the tide's going in the right direction at this juncture. So we'll provide you with more updates. And, um, you know, something else that, and I haven't even read the case yet, but I'll mention a strike against federal administrative agency power came out last week too. And I think it's the Sackett versus EPA case. And it's a case where a couple of folks, I think they're out West. I think they were in Idaho. Uh, they were trying to put a house in and do some, what I would consider minor excavation on their home. Um, and the, the federal government came in and said, Oh, you're doing some excavation that might run into a ditch that runs into another ditch that runs into a small stream that runs into a bigger stream that runs into another stream. And so we've got jurisdiction. You can't do what you want to do with your property. Um, kind of crazy if you read the facts of the case. Anyway, I have read those, but that's some good news too, where the, where the courts are stemming the power of federal agencies. So take a look at that case, do your duck, duck, go search and look for Sackett versus EPA. Yeah, because the 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 good news with that is that the Supreme Court is willing to rein in the authority of these administrative agencies that have uh, simply been delegated far too much authority, uh, I, I think is a violation of separation of powers uh, for a number of reasons. And this EPA case could have a significant impact on agencies like the ATF, for instance. Yeah, we can only hope that it has enormous impact. Yeah. So anyway, it's been it was a good week last week in the courts for folks that um, think freedom's important. Last thing I'll say before we get into the topic about defending pets uh, here today is that whether or not you own a, a firearm equipped with a pistol stabilizing brace um, and, and you're interested in being protected by this injunction that's been entered in, in the Fifth Circuit, these organizations, Firearms Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, Gun Owners of America, they're, they're great organizations. They do wonderful work protecting our civil liberties in the courts. And uh, whether or not you've got any interest in the pistol brace rule, we certainly encourage you to consider joining one of the organizations that we've mentioned. We, we are not uh, affiliated with them. We don't receive any sort of uh, compensation for uh, advocating membership to their to their uh, organizations, but uh, we think they are wonderful organizations. Yes, absolutely. All right. So with that said, uh, let's get into the topic for today, defending our pets, the legality of using force. So <laughs> we talk, you and I actually, we teach a, a five hour class about the legal concepts that we think people need to know uh, to carry, possess a firearm uh, for self-defense. <laughs> And one thing that comes up from time to time is, is people ask, well, what if somebody's trying to harm my pet? Can I, can I use force or can I use deadly force? And there's a significant distinct, distinction there, obviously. Um, so I, obviously I, I'm a dog person. We have a family dog uh, named Millie. We, we consider her a part of the family. Um, but there are some significant problems with trying to protect a family dog as opposed to your own life or the life of another person, right, Mike? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think maybe it's helpful to start out by saying just generally uh, 
the kind of context that we're talking about protecting the family pet within, and that's the, the self-defense framework, the legal framework for self-defense. Uh, you want to start out and say just a few things about that, Mike? Yeah. And once again, we're going to talk about defending your pet. Imagine you've got your dog on a leash or you're walking it somewhere um, and something happens where you think your dog is in danger of serious bodily injury or death. And that's what we're talking about. Can you use deadly force? And And, and I think what you have to kind of step back and think about the standard we apply to determine whether we're justified in using deadly force. And the one that we teach without going into a five or six hour class here is, and it comes from Masada U essentially, um, but the question is, are you facing an immediate, otherwise unavoidable threat of death or grave bodily harm to you or another person? And notice I said another person, and that person has to be innocent, another innocent person. Um, and, and the essential thing that you need to uh, think about today when we analyze the dog situation is it's, it talks about a person, defending a person, uh, not your family pet or your cat or whatever it is. And, of course, that assessment of whether you're facing an immediate, otherwise unavoidable threat of death or grave bodily harm to you or another innocent person has to be judged in the context of a reasonable person. Both, both objectively, meaning would the objective person think that, that that criteria was met, and did you think it was met under the context and circumstances of the time, at the time? So that was pretty quick, but that's, uh, you know, there's a distinction there. We're not protecting a person. A dog is not a person, uh, although many of us probably give our pets or our dogs a higher status than many people we know. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to realize that the dog... Uh, will never occupy a status higher than a person under the law, in my estimation, no matter how bad the person may be or how, you know, you may have somebody that's convicted of a gazillion crimes on their record. Um, but no matter how bad the person is, um, the dog will never achieve a higher status under the law. Yeah. So a pet, a dog or a cat, whatever the pet is, would be considered property. Uh, and, and property does not have the same status as, as a human life. So, We've talked a little bit about, you mentioned the standard that uh, we get primarily from Masad Ayub, uh, but there's also an, an, another helpful resource I'd like to point out, uh, and that's from Andrew Branca. He, he wrote the book Law of Self-Defense, and he identifies five elements that have to be present for uh, the justifiable use of deadly force, and that is uh, innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. And I, I think... It, it may be helpful at some point down the road for us to do an episode about some of these elements in more detail. But the key element here, I think, uh, when you're analyzing a situation where uh, you're trying to decide what degree of force to use with respect to pets is proportionality. Because like we said, a pet is property, not human life. And if you think about this concept of proportionality, the eye for an eye concept, you can't take a human life in exchange for property. Generally, there are some exceptions to that. Um, but with respect to pets, um, the answer generally, can I use deadly force to protect my pet is no. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more detail. Um, Mike, you want to say a little something about Texas, they're kind of a, we don't have the statute in front of us, but they're kind of an outlier in this regard. Yeah. And Alex mentioned a possible exception or exceptions. Generally speaking, understand please that you can't use deadly force or even threaten deadly force with respect to the defense of property. Now I'm not talking about castle doctrine. We'll carve that out. Um, and I think Alex, we've done an episode previously on that, but um, essentially your dog is the equivalent of your television um, in all states, except with probably the exception of Texas. And I think there's so many, um, if you read that statute there, it's so, somewhat vague in the term, like for instance, um, what's reasonable mean. So you even uh, maybe put yourself in legal jeopardy down there just because of the vagary of the statute potentially. Uh, and I'm not a Texas, we're not Texas lawyers. So you're on your own with regard to Texas law, but almost universally, uh, I will say that you cannot use deadly force uh, with respect to the defense of property. And if you're interested in the Texas statute and you're from Texas, I'd encourage you to talk to an attorney down there and look up the statute down there. But the other thing, and in, in, uh, John Correa from Active Self Protection says this a lot, the question is not, can you use deadly force? The question is, must you use deadly force? Because 
if you are in a situation where you're using deadly force against uh, a person or, or an animal, um, if you're in public, you, you could potentially face legal jeopardy for your negligent use of force if you were shooting in a, in a crowded place and hit somebody else, et cetera. So the question isn't, can you, it's must you use force? So even if you're protected by a statute like the one in Texas, potentially, uh, the question isn't, can you, it's must you. Yep. All right. So just because we can't use deadly force to protect our pet doesn't mean we can't use any force at all, right, Mike? No, I mean, I think uh, it's possible. That, I mean, depending on the circumstances, you certainly can use reasonable force, uh, but not deadly force to protect your pet. For instance, uh, I think probably a, a, a solution, if you believe your dog is in, seri in danger, um, is to use a pepper spray. I think it's effective against dogs, from what I understand. I never use it against a dog. Um, but that's something you may want to think about. But reasonable force is not deadly force. Yeah. Well, not it, reasonable force can be deadly force. Um, but uh, for instance, a less, less lethal method of defending your dog uh, would be pepper spray. And I think would be permissible, at least in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. And, and OC spray or pepper spray, it's, it goes by a number of names. We're talking more or less about the same, the same thing here. Um, but it's great not just for use with respect to defending pets, but also you potentially. There are lots of situations where you may be justified in defending yourself with something less lethal like or non-lethal like pepper spray and not deadly force. So we certainly encourage people to look into that as a possible option for self-defense uh, and defense of property potentially. So, and the other thing that it makes pepper spray, I think, particularly useful with animals or the defense of uh, animals is that uh, it creates distance. So a lot of people ask, well, what if I just use a, a shocker or, or a taser of, of some sort? Well, distance is extremely important and pepper spray can help maintain some distance that something like a taser wouldn't maintain. So um, again, that's a whole nother episode, but we certainly encourage people to look into pepper spray. All right. So, uh, Mike, you want to say, uh, it, there's we're, here, we're talking primarily about somebody attacking your pet. So your life's not in danger necessarily, but are there circumstances where somebody attacking your pet might give rise to the use of force in your own self-defense? Yeah. And I think I want to maybe not reiterate, just state clearly that with respect, you know, let's say you use pepper spray to defend your dog, essentially. Um, that is not a self-defense analysis at that juncture. Under the law, that's just the concept of necessity, mm -hmm. the lesser of two evils. I had to do this under the circumstances. It's sort of a common sense approach to the situation. So it's really not a self-defense analysis. But there could be situations in which your dog is attacked and you also believe, hypothetically, there could be, and, and where you believe also that you're facing an immediate, otherwise unavoidable threat of death or grave bodily harm. So there absolutely could be, but that analysis um, of self-defense would have to be applicable to you, not your dog. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I want to mention one thing. I'm always using the definition, otherwise unavoidable. Uh, we always encourage people to retreat if they can and not be involved in a, a deadly force or the threat of deadly force situation. So that's why that's in my definition. But I want to tell folks before they get too alarmed and, uh, about the situation, if you're in a, quote, stand your ground state, end quote, that avoidance element m is not necessarily uh, applicable or necessary in the circumstance. Um Obviously, we're attorneys here in Indiana, and this is not legal advice by any stretch. But we're, this is this podcast is just for educational purposes. But in Indiana, there's this concept of a forcible felony. You're allowed to use force, uh, sometimes deadly force, to stop the commission of a forcible felony. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and once again, well, let me ask it this way. I'm sorry to interrupt. Would, and more specifically, would attacking a pet be considered a forcible felony in Indiana? 
I don't believe that it would. I mean, I always I always hate to say absolute, but a forcible felony is generally a felony. Uh, it's going to involve the use of, of uh, or a, a threat of force and, against another person so the perpetrator gets his or her way. And that's going to involve uh, things like uh, arson of an occupied building, murder, rape, burglary, uh, residential entry, and I'm not sure of the distinction between those two you can address that residential entry versus burglary there's a difference there um but no um a forcible felony is not um you know uh, an, an attack on your dog yeah yeah because a dog again is not a person and the an element of forcible felonies is that they inv they involve uh potential harm to a human being to a person so um uh, and you mentioned residential entry versus burglary. This this may vary. This, these are Indiana specific uh, contexts here that I'm talk, speaking about. But burglary has, in addition to the breaking and entering of a, a dwelling, um, that the person also intend to commit a felony or theft therein. So, uh, whereas residential entry is simply the unlawful breaking and entering of a dwelling. So, okay, thanks um, for that. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I think we alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, if you are trying to defend your dog in a, in a public place, for instance, um, and you try and you uh, use a firearm, there are potential repercussions for the use of that firearm in a, in a public space. You want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, there could be local ordinances, county ordinances, those sorts of things that preclude, the discharge of a firearm, those I would think would be relatively minor to a concept that we call uh, that that we have in Indiana called criminal recklessness. Other states will have some other flavor of that, but basically criminal recklessness involves the knowing or intentional performance of an act that creates some sort of substantial risk of bodily harm to somebody, uh, somebody, a person. Um, and it can be a misdemeanor, but it also can be a felony, particularly if it's used with a deadly weapon, a firearm, for instance. So and the reason we bring this criminal recklessness potentiality up is that, um, you know, if you try to shoot at a dog, um, you could be endangering other people, not to mention yourself. I mean, a dog at your feet moving around or at, a, at some distance, you could discharge your firearm and endanger someone else. So um, and I never shot at a dog you know, running around at my feet, but, uh, I can imagine it would be very difficult to, um, uh, do that, particularly in a public place, uh, safely and effectively. Yeah. And, and when we train with firearms, we're, we're not typically training to shoot at things that are moving around at a fast pace, close to the ground. I mean, we're typically training like we're defending ourselves against another human being. So that's, that's a really odd way to uh, discharge a firearm. People aren't typically used to that. It's extremely hard to do effectively, and you could risk uh, causing danger to other people, uh, especially if you're in a public place. And in Indiana, that that criminal recklessness with a firearm is a felony. Uh, I don't know what it is in other states. It's like you, you mentioned, different flavors. Sometimes it's called reckless endangerment. It may go by other names. I don't know for sure. But those are potential legal uh, ramifications for your use of force if that force is seen to, to be unreasonable or reckless. Yeah, and if, keep in mind, once again, I'll go back to the pepper spray. If that force is deadly force, a firearm, for instance, um, you know, it can be a felony. If it's uh, pepper spray, that's less lethal. We're looking at a misdemeanor for the misuse of that. Of course, probably looking at nothing there. Um, um, so anyway, that once again, I'm, I'm an advocate for the pepper spray in that situation. And I will mention this to a lot of people in our classes. I mean, they carry pepper spray females. It's buried in their purse somewhere or a, a, a male has it, you know, buried in a cargo pocket. Uh, make sure it's accessible to you, um, uh, and practice with your pepper spray, uh, so that you know how to use it. You understand how wind can affect it. You understand the distances and how to deploy it. So make sure that you, they make inert sprays where you can practice. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating this. I'll tell you what I do or what our family does, you know, when they expire, 
then use those as a practice thing way out away from we live in the country so we you know do it someplace away from other folks but make sure you know how to use them and you they're accessible to you so they can be effectively deployed and and i should back up and clarify here we're, we're talking about two different scenarios really at first we were talking about is some one some person attacking or threatening your dog the next one we were talking about is is there another dog and this is maybe the more likely scenario yeah. is another dog attacking your dog and that's where you were talking about the lesser of two harms or the lesser of two evils and using force against the attacking dog that's attacking your own dog and i think that's a situation particularly where you you're at risk of something like criminal recklessness if you're in a public space like at a dog park etc uh, but that's also where I think, as you mentioned, OC spray, pepper spray may be extremely effective because, and I'll, actually I'll, I'll, I'll link, try to find this and link to it. I don't have it in the notes right now, but animals, dogs in particular, have a, a very dense uh, and high quantity of olfactory receptors. And so because they have such a heightened sense of smell, because they have so many olfactory receptors, pepper spray is particularly effective against dogs. Um, and there's actually an interesting discussion about this. And this is what I was alluding to. Uh, Mike Seeklander had a podcast, um, American warrior show, I think is what it's called. And he had a, I think it was his cousin. His name was Todd Orr. Mm -hmm. he hunts frequently, I think is a serves as a guide on many occasions. And he was hunting elk, I believe. This has been several years ago, so uh, I'm a little vague on the details of the story, but he was hunting uh, for elk and he was uh, carrying a firearm for protection, but also bear spray because he was in a place where, where brown bears, where grizzly bears were present. And he said, and I never looked into this to verify, but I've heard it from other sources that, that bear spray is actually more effective because like dogs, bears have an incredible number of olfactory receptors. And when they breathe as they're running, they, they inhale the, the bear spray and that either deters them or uh, incapacitates them for some brief period of time, at least until you can find safety. So I, I think the same thing would be applicable to dogs. And I, if you're interested in that discussion, it was, it was really interesting. His name was Todd Orr, and it was on the American Warrior Show podcast. And I'll try to link to that in the show notes. But anyway, I've kind of gone on a tangent there, but there's this argument anyway that OC spray, bear spray, pepper spray, et cetera, is actually more effective against animals than a firearm. Yeah, that's it. Um, I remember that story and it's happened a year or two or three. I, I lose track of time, but you might want to go and look that up, that story. Uh, it's actually a, pre a very, very interesting story. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's a good, I, I'm not an expert on bears by any stretch of the imagination. I probably would want to have both, but it bring and I'm kidding about this, but it brings up an interesting point. If you're going to use a firearm in defense of, for instance, a bear or some other federally protected species, boy, you better make sure you're justified in using that force. That may be the one instance where a federal agency might determine that an animal, um, is more valuable than a human life. So I, well, I'm kidding kind of about that, but, uh, uh, that's make sure you're justified in your use of force in that sort of scenario. That's for sure. Yeah. So just, uh, I think we're about ready to sort of close up the show here. I think just to kind of recap, generally the answer, can you def use deadly force to protect your pet? The answer is generally no, unless there is some, uh, facts and circumstances that would, you could articulate that your life was also in danger, but it, just for the protection of your pet, no, you cannot use deadly force. Okay. If, if, if it's a human attacking it, if it's a dog that's attacking your pet, you could use deadly force, but that creates a risk of other legal jeopardy. Like we talked about criminal recklessness or reckless endangerment, et cetera. And something like OC spray, pepper spray would be a better option. Is that accurate? Do you agree with that, Mike? Yeah, I think what you have to realize is, is that um, pets are property. 
is what it amounts to. So the analysis is essentially equivalent to your, like I said, your TV or other pieces of property. Can you use deadly force to protect property? And the answer is almost universally no. And I know that will frustrate some people, including us, because like, like you said, Mike, some people like or love their dogs more than, than other humans. And no matter how much you love your dog, like we love our dog, uh, the law still sees them as property. Yeah. We're just telling you what the law is, not making a value judgment, just telling you what the law is. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I think that's where we'll wrap it up. Mike, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we close up the show? No, I think I'm, I think we've covered it. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks again for joining the show. Uh, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to help us spread the message of freedom next week. I'll have an author, Ken Schooland, uh, on the show to discuss his book, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, A Free Market Odyssey. And I'll have a co-host next week with me as well, Aaron Sperling. He was on episode, I think it was episode 13, regarding Stoic philosophy. And he's going to help me discuss Ken Schooland's book, which had a profound impact on on me as a, as a young um, child and uh, really sort of a formative book in my life. So I hope you tune in for that. It's a great book and I think you'll enjoy the discussion. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. Keep an eye out for that until then. Can I say something oh, about sure. that? If you're a libertarian or have a libertarian Ben, and I don't mean libertarian in the sense of the libertarian party, I mean a true libertarian who believes in free. I shouldn't say it that way, but a libertarian that believes in freedom. Um, this is, and you want to influence uh, younger uh, folks, kids, children, this is the book to start with, and I think you'll find this episode, well, it may be for even us older folks as well, but I think you'll find this episode in incredibly enlightening and useful in terms of uh, spreading the uh, gospel of freedom. So It was, and I hate to prolong things here because we were just in the middle of wrapping things up, but it, it reminds me of an encounter that we had at the NRA annual meeting just a little over a month ago. We were at a seminar and uh, we were identified in the seminar as being criminal defense attorneys and uh, sort of constitutional attorneys. And um, after the seminar was over, a lady walked up to us and asked, how did you, I think she was addressing this question primarily to, to Mike, how did you keep your child conservative and, and, well, the answer was, well, we're not really conservative. We're more small L libertarian um, because apparently she'd had a child who grew up and is, is either in college or out of just barely out of college and apparently was very liberal despite having grown up in a conservative uh, household. And we didn't really have an answer for that. But these sort of texts, I think, that provide foundational principles about how people interact, how the world works, and the principles and moral uh, and ethical foundations of a free society, I think are extremely important. And that's that's why I'm looking uh, forward so much to this discussion next week with Ken Schoolin, uh, because I know it had a significant impact on me, uh, and I, I think would on others who read it as well, even adults. I mean, that's a book tailored toward young children. Um, but in and, and young adults, uh, maybe high school age, but the, the principles contained in the book are ones that most most adults with lots of letters and degrees don't understand. Yeah, and, and once again, we're going down a rabbit hole, but I think this book provides a, a framework to help folks think about the world and analyze the world and come to some um, principled decisions about what's going on in the world. So uh, it, it'll be a great episode, I'm sure. Um, I'm not in it to cloud up the <laughs> articulation of libertarianism. Um, so anyway, it's uh, please look that up whenever it comes next week. When it, uh, Next it Sunday it should get released. Yep. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Mike. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in and keeping out for that next week. And until then, remember, you are the Forge of Freedom.